just stop a thousand of them. I don't remember and they're gone from there. And this pirate outfit is John Paul Sark in mind. What instrument do you play? I, <laughs> I, I, didn't I used to play the right? Barry Sax. Sorry, I, I assumed you were someone totally different. My, my fault. I play the Barry Sax. Okay. Okay. Um, Monday, Tuesday? Wednesday, Thursday. All right. I am screencasting these last bit of notes. If you didn't know yesterday, um, I put up on, you should have got a notification in your email, but I got a, um, I put a screencast of the notes from yesterday for you PSAT folks. Let me get a few things out of the way first, because what I want to do is finish these notes, finish these notes, and then show you a video about the Erie Canal. But first, Let's talk about the, the, the fill in the blanks that we started the day before yesterday. What do you want me to do with this? Uh, just put it under the desk there. No, I think it's on Saturday. Um, Hold on. One thing. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Oh. Do you mind if I move a bit? If you're. Socially distanced with a mask on, yes, that's fine. So, due dates. I'll just write this down. Um, I really don't want to repeat myself, like, ever. So, please make sure that you get this. By Sunday at 11.59 p.m., you have two things due. One is the industrialization quiz. That is going to be over the notes that you have, and hopefully you've read chapter 14. It'll be mostly matching. It will, there also will be uh, like a short answer, but you know, not, not too much. And I'm, I'm screencasting this whole thing right now, so uh, FYI. There cometh a knock at my door. Was that the question for the screencast or for your own That's for the screencast, folks. Okay. 
then you are going to, I, I think I might have originally said that your midterm needs to be turned into bright space, but I'm going to change that now. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to share with me a Google Doc that has your midterm, rough draft. I want you to title it in a very specific way. So if you are Emma Beavers, you will the the, uh, the name of the file, if you will, the name of the doc should be Emma Beavers midterm Q1, because I think you are still doing question one, correct? And that's what I want it to look like. So I know which essay it is, and so I know which question it is, because what I would like to do is probably just grade all the ones first and grade all the seconds second, or the number two's second. My expectations on this are full essay. When I grade this, I'm going to be using the OSU rubric, OSU, OCU rubric for grading essays. And well, actually, no, I'm going to be using the one I gave you um, for the last essay, almost. And I can, yeah, I, I can show that to you uh, tomorrow. But the um, the point is, and for the most part, your grade is going to be: Did you turn in a complete essay? to me, start to finish, right? Did it address all the categories? Did it follow the midterm guidelines? And look at the midterm guidelines. I have sent the, those instructions to you twice now. Look them up. Then another part of your grade is gonna be when it's actually due, the final draft is due, did you take my, cons my feedback into consideration and change things? I mean, I might tell you that you've got, as it is right now, your rough draft is a 94%. Then if you take that and turn it in and don't do any changes, then I'm going to lower your grade a little bit because I will have something for you to fix, right? So you'll need to, to fix it. Yes? And that final due date, is that still like up in the air, like for whenever you finish it, or is there a definitive day? It is up in the air for now, I, I should have it back to you next week. I should. That's that's the, the goal, right? Because I have time to, to create it. It's due on Sunday. I should have Monday and Tuesday to work all through all those. Um, but I, I will let you know for certain. Yeah. We have a partial date for the rough draft and then a partial date for the final. Yes and no. I'm not going to put any points in until the final draft is due. But I'll tell you, I would give you a 46 out of 50, right? So you, you have an idea. Well. So the rough draft is due Sunday night, is that? Or? Both of these are, the, 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 the quiz. Right. Yeah. And your essay titled, titled this. Remember APA format, title page, running header, page numbers. I should make you write an abstract because that's also part of APA format, but I guess I'm not, but come up with a title for the essay too. I mean, not, not that title, not, not this title. This is the name of the essay or the, the name of the file that you're sending me, but you know, a title, what would you title your essay? If you, have, if you can't, if you can title it, then you can show me that you have direction for where you're going with it. If your title is midterm essay question number one, well, that's not really a title. Are you all with me? Okay. Don't work on the quiz with anyone and your work better be your own on the essay. Okay. Now, if you didn't watch the screencast of yesterday's information, try to find where Eli Whitney's interchangeable parts is. Then you can watch the screencast of yesterday. It's on Google Classroom on the stream. Yep. Um, what will our work look like for the week that we're not in school? Um, can let me try to clarify all that tomorrow because I, it's going to be the Jackson era politics. Tomorrow, like on bathroom. Yeah. Probably in an email. Thank you.
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, let me wrap my head around that a little bit better than what I have right now. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Good question. It's going to be a mix of some kind of discussion board post or quiz and some kind of probably at, at least one screencast, if not two. So. All right, so this is where we ended yesterday. I'm not going to go over this again except to say that interchangeable parts really helps make specialization of labor uh, more possible than, than ever before. And what that means is now people have in factories one job that they do repetitively over and over and over again. You know, a, a skilled worker like a carpenter doesn't do the same job over and over and over again. They don't swing a hammer at a nail the entire time, right? There's other things that they do as well, like drafting, right? And, and cutting and lifting up beams and, and all those kind of things, right? But when you get to the interchangeable parts, what it actually ended up doing was allowing for unskilled workers to do the exact same thing, basically a bolt tightener. That's what you do all day. The, uh, the part comes down the conveyor belt and you then it goes on and another part comes down. For those of you who are listening, I'm making a bolt tightening sound when I do, when you hear me go, do it. Okay. So, um, and that means that, you know, you can pay the workers less because they're not skilled, which of course is one way to lead to more misery. So Eli Whitney, uh, you know, very, very uh, important inventor, but uh, some of the unintended consequences of his cotton gin and his interchangeable parts uh, are not fun, fun things. If you were in here yesterday, yes, I'm calling you out. Tell me, who was the founder of the first American factory system? Samuel Slater, thank you. Women do the initial production in the home to preserve domesticity. Men do the finishing of the product outside the home in the factory. But that also gives women a little bit more freedom or opportunities, maybe I should say, than before because they actually get a wage. Francis Cabot Lowell took that and introduced the modern factory system in his Lowell Mills in Lowell, Massachusetts, or in the mills at Waltham, Massachusetts. And basically, it's it's what we have today in, in modern factories. All operations are done either under one roof or in one complex from start to finish. There's none of this, like, you do some at home and, and in people's actual houses and then ship it. You, you do it all under one roof. Um, his unique approach to labor shortages was hiring farm girls who were economic liabilities to their parents. There are few men available to work in factories because they are either farming or farming, <laughs> right? So, um, and their labor is too expensive if they're not farming because they're carpenters or, or lawyers or doctors or whatever, right? So he, he goes to the, the female part of society. Uh, Emma gave me a weird look. What does it mean? These are girls who are economic liabilities to their parents. Yeah, Sydney? Yeah, why? They're, they're, in, they're in your house. Yeah. Why especially, with, okay, th think, of, think of women who would not be economic liabilities to their parents. 20 years old. What would their situation be like? They're married. They're, married. They're out of the house. The parents don't have to pay for them anymore. So who? We, what are we talking about here? Unmarried, Unmarried women well, back then, still living at home. Back then, married, I remember, like 14. Well, well, I mean, sometimes, but don't... Well, 13 younger. And we're talking more like 
Okay, so that image of girls getting married really young, that, that did happen. There were child brides, but it's not as common as you might think. Like, I mean, James Madison didn't get married until he was like 40 and his wife was like 28 or something like that. You know, I mean, it, it, it wasn't. Right, right. So yeah, maybe in the lower classes, I get it, right? So yeah, these are these are unmarried women He hires them, and he gives them relatively good wages. He, in the factory complex, there are dorms where they can stay. They all know they're they're carefully supervised so that any men that might be around won't be lurking, you know, to cause <sighs> mischief. I'll just put it at that. But the Lowell system is in advance, and in. in industrialization because it eliminates that like middle man that two-step process in production is just all done under one roof and so the result of this is a, a vast reduction in cost as you can see in this little statistic right here oh and by the way where are you going to find Lowell and Slater putting their factories up what region of the country? Yeah. Northern and Western, but not Southern. And just look at the, the map here, right? I mean, yesterday, if you weren't here yesterday, if you haven't watched yesterday, like everything that I talked about, transportation, it's connecting North and West. Canals, railroads, connecting North and West. Industrialization, as you can see here, is in the North at the beginning of this era and then it spreads west and it becomes even more concentrated in the north and there's not very much in the south um, the south will continue to feel like the odd man out so again just a reminder for those of you who were not here yesterday did industrialization help lead to a civil war well in the way if you think of it as there's a way of life emerging down here that is different from a way of life up here and these two sections west and north are becoming closer together and the South is feeling ostracized in this triangle, then you can kind of see where the tensions might arise. And I think this is last, mm -hmm. right? Uh, even before the Civil War, we get sewing machines. Some of your grandparents or great grandparents might have even owned a Singer sewing machine. And of course, that allows textiles to be made even faster and cheaper and more jobs and etc. Okay, questions? Oh no, there is there's a little bit more. Is this hold, hold on, I'm sorry. There, it's not it's not the last one. Okay. There there you go. Before industrialization, you have a labor management system that is almost like father-child. Because if you want to become a carpenter, if you want to become a stone mason, you go through an apprentice process. And your apprentice may not be your, sorry, the, uh, the person who is being your mentor, your, the, the master, if you will, uh, is not necessarily always your father, although it could be. Right. But the person like if you go to apprentice with somebody else, like to become a blacksmith, like it's almost like it's a father son relationship. Right. Um, you become that close together. Uh, the Industrial Revolution changes that to basically where um, before where you would have pride in your workmanship because you you pounded out that metal from start to finish into a plow or something like that. Right. You don't have ownership in the product anymore. You don't have pride in your in your work as much anymore. Instead of working alongside your boss. Pardon the interruption with Hunter Hernandez. Please report to the office. There instead becomes like a middle management. They're they're professional managers, and they don't always necessarily think of you as an apprentice. They think of you as a cost of labor. 
labor becomes a cost of production, which, which means like, if I want to make a profit as a businessman, I have to reduce my costs and the workers in my factory, you become dollar signs. And if you are big dollar signs, I need to shrink you down to little dollar signs, which means I need to pay you less. Now, this guy was an abolitionist, and he'll run for president after the Civil War, Horace Greeley. But he also owned a, a newspaper, and in his newspaper, he said, uh, the average family needs $10 a week to survive in 1840, but the average man only made $5 a week. So what does that mean has to happen if you're going to make ends meet for a family? Right? And if, you know, all, almost always women are going to be paid less, so... You're going to have to have your children work too. Just some stats on child labor. In 1820, 47% of the industrial workers in Connecticut were children under the age of 18. 47%. Because you could pay them less. They can't, they can't fight back, right? Rhode Island, over half of the workers were children. Now, the early labor unions would have been found in the Lowell Mills. Some of the earliest labor unions in the United States would have been amongst those women. Some of the earliest strikes in labor union history in the United States were of the women in Lowell Mills striking against their um, bosses. But for the most part, unions were considered illegal. Uh, or at least in the, bosses of the, uh, in the minds of the bosses, these were like, you know, instigators and we're just going to fire them because there were no laws to protect it. The one thing, uh, this is a Massachusetts state Supreme Court. This is not the Supreme Court. This is a state court in Massachusetts. This is the only bright spot for labor unions. They said labor unions essentially had a, a right to exist. But that's really the only pro-labor message you're going to get from any government that I know of during this time period. Not like that helped them very much. Some things about the communication revolution. Um, add on one last revolution to all these other revolutions that I talked about in this. An American painter named Samuel Morse invented the telegraph, how he went from being an artist to, to being able to transmit sound across wires, I don't know. Not sound, dots and dashes across wires. I, I, I don't know that backstory. That'd be kind of cool to find out. Um, I, you know, the, the, the telegraph was revolutionary because how long would it take to get a message from Washington, D.C. to New York City normally? You have to either walk it or sail it, right? If you sail it, it, it might take you, you know, a couple of days, right? But... Um, now, minutes, right? And, and you've got a message sent across a wire in minutes. That's revolutionary. His first message sent across a telegraph wire was this phrase. When the, the, the dots and dashes were interpreted, it came out to what hath God wrought, which is old King James for basically saying, what has God made? What has God inspired us with in gifted us this is revolutionary it, it's almost as if like you know god inspired this thing to be in, 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 in my brain because it's so it's magical almost right just out of curiosity do you know what the name or what the, the the quote was the first phrase that was sent across a telephone wire Hello. <laughs> actually uh interesting point alexander graham bell did not want people to say hello when they answered the phone he wanted the official greeting when you answer the phone to be a sailor's greeting. Ahoy. I wish, bro. That would be so happy. That's why if you watch The Simpsons, which I found out yesterday that the three seniors in the room don't watch The Simpsons. Like, if you watch The Simpsons, good. Mr. Burns, who is, you know, the, the oldest person on the show, he'll always answer the phone saying, ahoy, ahoy. And it's, it's just a... It's a smart show, right? No, Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, he was in run, one room. His um, 
assistant Watson was in another room. They were on either ends of the, of the wire, right? And uh, the first message that, that Watson heard across the telephone was, Watson, come here, I need you. <laughs> Not quite as grand as what hath God wrought. Primarily used to tie together urban and trade centers. In other words, cities. So what does that mean as far as sectionalism goes? Yeah. And not not as much. It did. There were connections between the north and the south, but not not as much as between north and west. Cyrus Field will later stretch a cable across the Atlantic Ocean, which might come into play during when we talk about World War One later. And of course, there was also the Pony Express, and the Pony Express was this kind of romantic, adventurous kind of thing that probably killed more boys than young boys than uh, we'd like to, to think about. But um, you, know, you start in St. Louis, you, they actually asked for, in their advertisements, young, wiry, thin boys, wiry, so people. Right, because oh. it, it's not as much weight on the horse, right? And they also preferred orphans. That way when they died, no one cared? That was the, that was the gist. Wow. Uh, right? That's a rough one. Because what they're doing is they're starting in St. Louis, and they're riding a horse until the horse is dead tired, and then they, they have a, another horse waiting for them in the next town, and then they ride the horse until the horse is dead tired, and you can get a, a letter across the country in 10 days because there wasn't a transcontinental railroad yet. Um, and of course, there are Native Americans out there, there are wild animals, um, there's, there's de, you know, dehydration, um, so. Okay, uh, Erie Canal video, there is, if you go onto the next page, there are some questions. Let me just uh, There are five questions under the bullet point Erie Canal. I would like you to watch this video, and while the video is going, see if you can answer the questions. They may or may not be in order. They seem somehow in a way a representation of American limitlessness, geographic limitlessness. It's hard to imagine, unless you really set your mind to it, that will this ever anything else. It's almost as if Manhattan had been a city since antiquity, that somehow the Indian tribes that lived here had put down pavement. That great plan indicated to people who had no intention of stopping. What they're talking about in this part, and I tried to get it where it was going to start at the Erie Canal, so we're close. But they were talking first about the, the grid plan for New York City, you know, all the avenues and, and so on. And so they're waxing rhapsodic about that right now. But they'll get to the Erie Canal in just a minute. Island, uh, and uh, there. And it was part of an optimism uh, that was real. And it was an optimism that was self-fulfilling. Uh, you lay out a street plan like that, and the next thing you know, something's bought it on a lot. And uh, the transportation followed. And, uh, it wasn't long before you had uh, horse-drawn uh, trolleys. The commissioner's plan of 1811 was one of the most far-sighted urban visions ever conceived. And yet its audacity was nothing compared to that of another proposal to Whitman put forward that same year. Not an eight-foot map, but a 363-mile-long ditch, and if completed, would transform forever. New York's relation to the entire American continent. When you think of the United States in 1800, it's really a country that's huddled along the East Coast. Movement to the interior of the North American continent is blocked by what we no longer think is a substantial mountain chain, the Appalachian of the Alleghenies. But from the perspective of 1800, they were impressive indeed. There were no blasted highways through there. There were no railroads through there. There were no rivers that took you easily through there. You had to walk up those mountains and walk down them and then up another one and down. So they were a formidable barrier. And what we had to do, both in New York and in the nation, is to figure out a way to 
hid inside the cup. For years, New York merchants had been dreaming of the immense wealth locked in the continent's interior. In 1811, De Winton came up with a way of getting at it. If nature had provided them no river to the west, New Yorkers would simply have to build one. When one looks at a map of the United States, and one looks at the Mississippi River, one cannot but assume that the greatest city in the New World is where New Orleans is. Here's one of the greatest river systems in the world. But it didn't happen that way. And it didn't happen that way because New Yorkers took the geographical advantage they had and got access to that uh, agricultural hinterland that seemed to belong to New Orleans. The only gap in the chain of mountains running from New Hampshire to Georgia is providentially located in New York State. And Governor DeWitt Clinton had enough sense to see that this was a very valuable asset and to build the Erie Canal over the collective dead bodies of most of the politicians from New York City who did not see that connecting the Middle West to the Hudson and New York City would turn into a cash cow. The scope of the project was nothing less than mind -blowing. An artificial waterway, unlike anything undertaken since the days of the ancient Egyptians. At a time when the longest canal in America ran just 27 miles, and most less than two, Clinton's canal would have to run more than 350 miles across the rugged wilderness of upstate New York. Thomas Jefferson himself rejected the scheme outright, calling it little short of madness. So did the New York State Legislature and President James Madison, who warned that its $5 million cost would bankrupt the federal government. But DeWitt Clinton would not be deterred. The Great Erie Canal, he declared, would make New York one of the most splendid commercial cities on the face of the earth. Appealing directly to the public, he lobbied tirelessly for what his detractors called Clinton's Big Ditch, holding mass rallies in New York City and circulating a petition eventually signed by more than 100,000 New Yorkers. Clinton himself devised an ingenious scheme to pay for it all, using public funds to attract private investors, and showing once and for all how great public works could be built in a democracy. How did Clinton build the Erie Canal? By promising bankers he would make money if they lent him the funds to do so. Uh, and no ideology about it. Jefferson wouldn't dream of having the national government involving itself in an affair of this kind. For doctrinal reasons, the, the Jeffersonians were against internal improvements. Uh, Hamilton was all for them, and uh, boy did they make money. That was a well-loved senator from New York. state of New York, encouraged by Governor DeWitt. I just want you to know that, and I probably might have even said this last year, that when you become a social studies teacher, if you become a social studies teacher, you can get all sorts of cool free stuff. Like I got, there, there are several institutions, organizations that will send you places and pay you stipends to learn from college professors and go to historical sites. <coughs> I've done so many. I got to go to New York City and stay in Columbia University, King's College. I guess I got a scholarship to King's College. I probably shouldn't brag. <laughs> anyway, um, the point is, I got to, to sit and listen, uh, you know, study under him for a whole week. I got paid for it. It was great. The, 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 the flight there was free. It was awesome. So, just, just wanted you to know that I'm kind of a big deal. But the issue, what at the time was a staggering indebtedness of issuance bonds to build this waterway across upstate New York, connecting essentially the Hudson River and Albany with the Great Lakes <coughs> and Buffalo. That ditch, that 363-mile ditch, only a couple dozen people on, was the most important public works project in American history until the Interstate Highway Program was passed in 1956. 
The canal was dug with Irishman mules and Monongah heel and whiskey in about seven years. <clears throat> and mass. And, and you cross now now it's still there. Uh, now clean because Lake Erie is clean. And uh, you go on now every fifteen miles you come to a town where something extraordinary in manufacturing commercial history. It was one of the few public works projects in New York that didn't have a cost overrun, it was finished on schedule. In fact, it paid for itself by being partially open before it was fully completed. On October 26, 1825, three full years ahead of schedule, the mammoth undertaking was complete. The Great Erie Canal, one observer said, <coughs> has defied nature and used it like a toy. With 83 locks and 18 aqueducts, including an 800-foot water bridge over the Genesee River, it was the greatest engineering feat of its day. It had also worked nothing less than an economic miracle. It had once cost more to ship a ton of goods 30 miles in than all the way to England, and taken more than three weeks to move a ton of wheat from Buffalo to New York. <coughs> now, it took just seven days and the cost had been cut from $100 to less than 6 At the opening celebrations, the Whitman, the undisputed hero of the day, poured a keg of water drawn from Lake Erie into New York Harbor. The symbolism was lost on no one. All America now met in New York. The mountains have been leveled. The valleys have been filled. Rivers and gulfs have been formed over them, which will unite the waters of the Hudson. That was a paraphrase the of the Bible. The Atlantic, where the waters of the remote west will constitute a river. The Reverend F. H. Cumming. It just brought things alive in America as they had never done before. And that now. There, that that, you know, at, at a certain point, this documentary becomes a little bit of a propaganda piece for how awesome New York City is. So I'll just stop it there. because they... Let's just look at these questions. What is the effect of the Erie Canal on the cost of the transportation of goods? Whoa. Not all at once. The increased. One word, increase, right? What was the effect of the Erie Canal on the growth of river cities? Like Cincinnati, like Louisville, like Pittsburgh, like New Orleans. I mean, no, the opposite one is It decreased the growth. Why? Because it, instead of directing down the Ohio River, down the Mississippi River, those Midwestern goods are going to go north through the canal. So what's going to happen to Great Lakes cities? Like Cleveland, Rochester, Buffalo, Chicago, yeah. Oh, yeah, New York, New Orleans, obviously they New York grows like gangbusters and New Orleans doesn't. How does the Erie Canal contribute to sectionalism? It's connecting the west and the in the in the north. Whereas before the west should have been connected to the south. By a New Orleans. <clears throat> the other day I was on Facebook Live, walking downtown, minding my business. Actually, I was really minding my business. I know exactly what I was doing. At 4 30 on Tuesdays, there are some Democrats that set up right here, according to know exactly where you're talking about. <laughs> on this side of the street, there are some Republicans. So funny. So I put it on my Facebook Live, right? I'm going down there, and I had my phone down like this, 
And I asked the Democrats, you know, can I put you on Facebook Live? It, it, it's running, right? And they were like, sure. So I, you know, this guy tells me that he knows my last name and he's not convinced that I am going to represent him fairly. But he proceeds to tell us stuff anyway, like Donald Trump is responsible for the death of 180,000 people. He's a murderer. I go to the other side. Hold on. And I asked them, hey, do you guys want to be on Facebook Live? And one of the gentlemen there said, if you put me on Facebook, I will cut off your ears. <laughs> if you... okay. So it was not uh, the best day for being somebody who's kind of in the middle of politics. Put yourself there. I'm gonna say, not the best day to walk around on Facebook Live. But it's public, so you can go see it. That's so sad. I think we're dead. My mom keeps dying. Oh, she does. Why? Because like. Every every week, once a week, I'm, walk, I'm just walking past his room, minding my business, and he'll say something about, oh, it's just not like Beavers being on Facebook, saying a, and he'll tell me something that I did. That you week. are pretty vocal on Screencast is still going on. Whoops. <laughs> 